Hello, everybody. This video is over the Elaboration Likelihood Model, or the ELM. Now, really quickly, the ELM was proposed by two researchers known as uh, two researchers, uh, Cassiopo and Petty. <coughs> Now, they argue that, uh, and the model has been well validated, um, that um, there are two routes of, pers two types of persuasion. And uh, they use the word persuasion here to mean attitude change. So there's two types of attitude change. There's central route persuasion or central route attitude change, and there's peripheral route persuasion or peripheral out route uh, attitude change. Now, central route attitude change or central route persuasion is persuasion that occurs because of careful consideration of the qualities of a message. All right. So if the, if the message uh, is, it has a lot of uh, logical points, a lot of good points, a lot of strong points, um, a lot of evidence, then uh, you're probably going to be more persuaded than if it doesn't have that, doesn't have those features. Whereas peripheral route attitude change or peripheral route um, persuasion occurs when you rely more on peripheral features, maybe of the source, maybe of the message. Um, uh, so, you know, the more attractive they are, the more likely you are to be persuaded, you know. Uh, that would be more likely when people are persuaded through peripheral, uh, uh, when the type of attitude change is peripheral route. Uh, attitude change. Now, so right there off the off the top, we have two types of attitude change: central route attitude change, central route persuasion, and peripheral route attitude change or peripheral route persuasion. And again, central central route it's all about uh, thinking, look, considering the quality of the message. Peripheral route there's not much thinking going on. All right, it's more about uh, you know these peripheral features, these cues, these. Uh, uh, little pieces of information that we use heuristically to decide whether or not we're going to be change our attitude, uh, we're going to be persuaded or not. Now, um, <clears throat> when uh, according to uh, the ELM, uh, everybody wants to have correct attitudes, but whether or not people um, think about a particular message depends on, well, whether or not they have the motivation to think, really, when it comes down to it. Um, so when people are motivated to think, then they're more likely to, if they're persuaded, they're more likely to uh, experience central route uh, persuasion, central route attitude change. When they don't, when they're not motivated to think and they're persuaded, then they're more likely to experience peripheral route persuasion. Now, then the question becomes, when are we motivated? Well, there's a number of different features. Again, you know, there's individual difference features, there's uh, uh, situational features, there's all sorts of features that can make us more or less motivated to think. When we think, we elaborate on a message more. When we elaborate more, we're using, uh, we're cent we're using central route processing. We're thinking carefully about the message, thus the name of the model, elaboration likelihood model. All right. When is elaboration likely? When we're motivated to think. So when are we motivated to think? Well, again, there's a number of individual individual difference variables. What is an individual difference variable? An individual difference variable is some uh, dimension, some uh, feature, some quality upon which every individual differs. Individual differences. All right. So you know we we're not all equally extroverted. We're not all um, uh, equally energetic. We're not all equally, uh, we don't all equally care about sports, you know. So all of these are individual differences, all right. So they're all dimensions, personality traits, interests that individuals differ from one another on. That's what an individual difference is, okay. So there's all manner of individual difference that can predict when a person is more or less likely to think. For example, need for cognition. Need for cognition is an individual difference that reflects a person, the extent to which a person enjoys thinking, okay. So people who are high in the need for cognition, they really enjoy thinking, even if they don't have something to think about. Even if they don't have something to think about, they're probably going to try and find something to think about because they just enjoy thinking. People who are low in the need for cognition, on the other hand, they're more likely to avoid thinking. If they, they're, they're pretty much only going to think when they really have to. 
all right, when the, mot when the situation really pushes them to do it. So a person who's high in the need for cognition is more likely to think and therefore more likely to elaborate on a message. Now here's one cool bit. When, let's, it's cool to me. When people think about a message and they, elabor they elaborate on the message that they've received, they tend to become sensitive to something called argument quality. So again, you know, we've already talked about, you know, uh, you know, there's some messages are logical, they have a lot of evidence, others aren't so logical, they don't have a lot of evidence, the, the points aren't as good. So there's a difference in the quality of those kinds of messages. Those with a lot of evidence, those, those that are highly logical, those are strong messages, strong, strong arguments. Those who don't have a lot of evidence, those who, that aren't terribly logical, those are weak messages. Well, when a person thinks, when a person elaborates on a message, they tend to be sensitive to argument quality, such that they tend to be more persuaded by strong arguments than by weak arguments. So uh, people who are high in the need for cognition, again, those people who just enjoy thinking, they are more likely to be persuaded by strong arguments than by weak arguments. Interestingly, people low in the cognition, low in the need for cognition, so people who don't enjoy thinking, they tend to be equally persuaded by both. They don't tend to show much of a difference between how persuaded they are by strong arguments versus how, hard, uh, how persuaded they are by weak arguments. Okay, so that's one individual difference. Mood, that's another. Uh, people who are in a positive mood tend to be more persuaded, um, uh, uh, easily persuaded than people in a negative mood. On the other hand, people who are in a negative mood tend to think more. So people who are in a negative, who experience a negative mood tend to be sensitive to argument quality. So people who are in a slightly negative mood tend to be more persuaded by strong arguments than by weak arguments. They're sensitive to argument quality. People who are in a good mood tend to be fairly persuaded by both of them. So again, there's not as much of a difference uh, whether, uh, as to whether they are persuaded by strong arguments or weak arguments. Um, so negative mood. People who are in a negative mood are more likely to elaborate. People who are in a positive mood are less likely to elaborate. But you have to be careful when using negative mood, especially when you're using fear to evoke that negative mood. When you use a mildly fear-arousing message, then you're going to get the, the typical uh, negative mood effect. People who are in negative mood will think more, and they're going to be more sensitive to argument quality. But if they are too frightened, then there's, uh, then there's a chance that they will just quit thinking, they will quit elaborating. And so the sensitivity to argument quality goes away. Now, there are other uh, situations that uh, can influence whether or not someone is persuaded. Uh, so for example, if the situation, the message is highly relevant, all right, which is kind of also a different individual difference, uh, uh, individual difference because you know, uh, relevance to you is not going to be relevance to me. So it's also an individual difference variable. Um, but personal relevance, though, those messages that are highly personally relevant, uh, tend, a message for which, uh, which is highly, blah, 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 a message that is highly personally relevant for an individual uh, <laughs> will uh, lead them to be more sensitive to argument quality. So if, so if a message is personally relevant to you, and the argument is very strong, and you're going to be more persuaded than if it's weak. But if an argument is not personally relevant to you, then how strong the argument is probably isn't going to affect you that much. The last one I wanted to mention is self-control. So there's some work now suggesting that people, uh, that people have a limited self-regulatory ability, all right? It's known as the strength model of self-regulation. Yes, there has been some uh, question as to uh, the evidence behind it, but as far as I know right now, it still has the majority, it, it still has more evidence for it than against it. Um, now, according to the strength model of self-regulation, our ability to control our behavior, our ability, which can involve our ability to carefully think about things, uh, relies on a limited resource. We haven't identified, as far as I know, what that resource is. There was some indication that it was uh, blood glucose levels, but then there was something suggesting that that's not necessarily the case. So we're not necessarily sure what that resource is, but there's some resource that uh, tends to, that's limited, that our ability to regulate our own behavior depends on.
when some behave when so, when we've done something that depletes those resources our subsequent ability to regulate our behavior our subsequent ability to make a decision our subsequent ability to not eat chocolate our subsequent ability to make ourselves do something we don't necessarily want to do our subsequent ability to self control self regulate is impaired all right so really quickly well we'll slow it down a bit again Strength model of self-control. Self-control, your ability to inhibit your impulses, your ability to say no when you want to say yes, or your ability to say yes when you want to say no. All right. Your ability to self to control yourself <clears throat> depends on a limited resource. Every time you engage in an act of self-control, every time you control yourself, every time you see a chocolate cake and don't eat it, every time you see a pizza and don't eat it, every time you go to the gym when you don't want to, every time you engage in self-control, you deplete that resource. That leaves less of that resource to fuel future self-control. So let's say you went to the gym, you made yourself go do it. You didn't want to do it, but you made yourself go do it. Well, now when you get home and there's a piping hot, delicious freaking looking pizza on the table, your ability to stop yourself at one or two slices is going to be, uh, you're, uh, is going to be uh, weaker. You're, you're not going to have as much of an ability to control your eating uh, after having worked out because when you made yourself go work out, provided you didn't enjoy, provided you don't enjoy working out, you're having to act, you're acting, you're engaged in self-control. That depletes that resource. And you're probably having to uh, execute that self-control the whole time that you're at the gym. If you don't enjoy the gym, you don't enjoy the gym. Um, so then when you get home and there's this delicious looking food, you're probably going to eat more of it than you should because you don't have as much ability to control now back to persuasion. If something has impaired your regulatory abilities, has depleted them somehow, then your ability to engage in self-control is interfered with. It's attenuated. So let's say that you're fatigued. Your uh, self-regulatory abilities are impaired. And somebody gives you a message and you uh, want to think about it, but you don't you you are probably not going to think about it as much because unless you're motivated to do so like it's highly personally relevant or something like that you're probably not going to think about that message you're going to be less likely to think about that message if you've already engaged in some ag regulatory act so you know so if we were to have some were to have some people engage in some self regulation have other people not to and then give them uh, an argument, either strong or weak, we would probably find that those who had been given that previous uh, uh, regulatory act, so they were made to exercise, or they were made, you know, the typical tasks are things like, you know, go through a task, uh, go through a, a, a book or a, 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 like some kind of narrative, some kind of story, and cross out every like second and fourth E. All right, so you're having to follow a rule. Um, but you would first learn to just go through and check off all E's, and then you would be asked to check off like the second and fourth E. So now you have to follow a rule. You've got something that's automatic, check off every E, and then you have to control it. You have to uh, self control your, you have to control yourself to not cross off every E, but instead only cross off every second and fourth E. So, <clears throat> you know, that's your standard or one of the ways you can impair regulatory ability. You know, there are other more fun ways. So for example, I know in one study, uh, they had some participants uh, sit in front of a table that had freshly baked cookies, uh, and they were told not to eat any. And others were told they could. But the ones who were told not to eat any, they're impairing their regulatory ability. They're having to exact self-control. So there's a number of ways that you can re reduce self-control, but let's say you have some people reduce their regulatory ability and others not. And then you give them a strong or weak message. You would probably find that those who, whose resources, their regulatory resources have been depleted, so they've, they've engaged in some act about self-control and they don't have as much of that limited resource left, they're not, they're, the extent to which they're persuaded by strong and weak messages is going to be about the same. But people who have not engaged in some self, act of self-control, so that their regulatory resources 
are fairly intact, they're probably going to be more sensitive to argument quality. That means they're going to be more persuaded by strong arguments than by weak arguments. Now, to jump back right quick to the strength model of, strength model of self-regulation, those regulatory resources are repleted. They're repleted every day. If you just wait long enough, you rest. If you rest long enough, they'll they'll replete. Um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, just just going through the day can can deplete those resources. So, for example, there's the morning morality effect, uh, in which people are more likely to engage in moral actions that require self control in the morning than they are in the afternoon or the evening. Why? Because as they go through the day, they're, you, they're engaging in more self-control and they're depleting more of that regulatory resource. So they don't have as much of the regulatory resource in the evening as they do in the morning. So preventing themselves from doing something, controlling themselves and preventing themselves from doing something they probably shouldn't do but they want to do, that uh, is easier to do in the morning because they have more regulatory resource to do it with. Okay? And that uh, is uh, that experience of losing that regulatory resource, it's referred to as ego depletion. Okay, so when you've engaged in an act of self-regulation, then it depletes that uh, self-regulatory resource. That is ego depletion. So again, you know, people who experience ego depletion, not sensitive, they're not sensitive to uh, uh, argument quality. People who have not experienced ego depletion, they are sensitive to argument quality. All right, and that, my friends, is it for this video on the ELM, or the Elaboration Likelihood Model. If you have any questions, per the usual, send them my way. Now, that's it for this video.